Welcome to the Visionaries Podcast, sponsored by Alchemy. I'm your host, Jim Roos. The Visionaries Podcast shines a light on financial institutions at the cutting edge of digital transformation, providing you with the tips and tricks to elevate your digital game, no matter what size your organization is. Growing from $2.5 billion to $4 billion in the past five years, the Biloxi-based Keesler Federal Credit Union has become one of the largest credit unions in the United States. With 39 locations across three states and three branches in the United Kingdom, their credit union has 280,000 members. What sets Keesler Federal Credit Union apart is not just their exceptional growth, but their ability to anticipate industry trends and give back to the community. Their unwavering commitment to innovation, combined with a commitment to the members in their community, has earned them national recognition. My guest on the Visionary Podcast today is Jason McDonald, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer of Keesler Federal Credit Union. We discussed many of the ways Keesler Federal Credit Union has achieved growth without sacrificing personalized service. Keesler Federal Credit Union is founded in 1947 to serve the military personnel at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi. Keesler has won the Credit Union National Association's Dora Maxwell Social Responsibility Award on multiple occasions and may be best known for the response to community needs delivered after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Jason, before we discuss what makes Keesler Federal Credit Union unique, can you share a little bit about your extensive credit union background, your current responsibilities, and your involvement in the digital transformation process at Keesler? Yeah, good morning, Jim. Uh, so I've been uh, in the credit union space for close to 20 years now. Uh, I spent 13 years working uh, for Central Minnesota, and I spent the last five years uh, working for uh, Keesler Federal Credit Union. And uh, I was recruited to come down to uh, the uh, the beach here in uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And one of the reasons they brought me down here was to digitize the organization. I think uh, they had they had really fallen behind, you know, whether it was the website, the brand, uh, the digital presence. And so they, they really needed a refresh there. And at the time, there's and there still is new leadership that was put in place. And so I was part of that that new leadership that came in to kind of uh, revitalize the credit union. So I'm responsible for. Uh, all things uh, digital. Uh, I've got project management that rolls up into me, uh, doing some uh, strategic planning as well. So uh, I got I got a few different hats that I wear, but uh, you know, primarily focused on on the digital side of things. So since in our introduction we talked about the fact that you've grown from two point five billion to over four billion in the last five years, what would you attribute this growth to? And what has changed at the credit union besides the leadership in the last five years? Yeah, that's a good question. So like I, I did mention the leadership piece. Um, I think that's important. Um, what's what's changed in those last five years? Well, um, I, I think it's it's one of those uh, when when um, um, preparation meets perspiration. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where we we put a focus uh on growth and when when you put a focus on growth and you build a vision around that that started uh with our board of directors and that and that was a clear objective from them for us uh and then you move down into the leadership and you know over that that period of time to grow to basically double um there were a lot of different strategies that that we deployed um branching was a big a big strategy and i'm a technologist and I know there's folks out there, you know, been talking for a while about the branches being dead. I think there's a resurrection there with the branches, uh, albeit the, the appropriate size branch for the appropriate community. Um, but really branching was a big piece of that for us uh, and getting into communities that that we weren't in previously, um, but they weren't bridges too far. You know, we moved out geographically uh, in the appropriate manner. And when you look at our geography, we're kind of spread out between Jackson uh, over to New Orleans and then uh, over to uh, Mobile. So you almost look at it as a diamond. So I think that branching piece had a lot to do with it. Um, we also put some people in place, not just the leadership, but um, we do community development and a lot of community outreach. We're big on on community. And actually that's our purpose is to build better communities. And so we put folks uh, it, within those communities, um, really kind of immersing themselves and and getting a good feel for for what makes up that area, what makes up that community, because every community is different. And you know, you could be sixty miles away from from your headquarters, and it could be a completely different uh, community that requires uh, a different approach, different technology. So, uh, those community development people, you know, helped out a lot. 
Um, you know, I mentioned we did a rebranding. Uh, I think that certainly helped us. Um, it was a looking a little dated previously. Um, so we went through a big rebranding initiative and then uh, we just really amped up our digital presence. And, and I think, you know, I mentioned the branch piece. Uh, branches and, and the digital are so complementary of one another. Uh, they go hand in hand. It's like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, you can't have one without the other, in my opinion. Uh, I know there's digital banks out there that are that are working on you know just that digital presence, and I think that's appropriate uh, depending on the market and the community. But you know, for us, they they go hand in hand. So it's interesting. So I speak to banks and credit unions across the country. There's a significant focus on digital transformation, and and no different at your organization. This includes investing in new technology, and rethinking back office operation to improve the user experience. You know, during this time of significant economic uncertainty everywhere. What areas of digital banking experiences are you focusing on at Keesler? From a digital banking perspective, um, we're hyper-focused on the member experience and and really understanding our member needs. I remember the, I mentioned those community development officers and, uh, and we're doing uh, outreach within communities. And what we do is we have these regional advisory boards made up of local business leaders and we get together with them and we really try and understand what's going on in that market and, and understand uh, the needs of that specific market and then kind of tailor our approach to meet those needs. You know, without without understanding the members needs, you can really miss the mark. And, you know, so we're, we're really focused on that. And what we do is we take we take that information back, excuse me, along with a lot of surveys. We're doing uh, surveys on the quarterly. Uh, we're doing net promoter scores. We're doing member satisfaction index uh, scoring, uh, of which we're we're extremely high. Uh, we we average about 94 on our member satisfaction index. Uh, we're hitting 76 on our net promoter scores. So we built this loyal cult following, and and that's really because we've been focusing, um, really focusing on the member needs, and then taking that into into the digital space. Now, you know, COVID really accelerated that. And I know we've all talked about what that did from a digital perspective, but it turbocharged um, our, our digital offering. We, uh, we went live. I, I mentioned that, you know, I came down here to digitize the organization. We went live with uh, Alchemy on April 20th of 2020, which was right when COVID was hitting. And uh, we were actually one of the first to do a, a virtual conversion. Uh, at the time, we had about 120,000 members. And, uh, and so it was a pretty significant deal. And, uh, you know, we went, we, we came through that, uh, for the better. And I think it helped that we came off a platform that was just wasn't great. Um, uh, but I mean, you, the amount of adoption that came as a result of that was just been, been incredible. And we talked about the double growth that we've had in the last five years. We've seen that same growth, um, on the digital platform. We do things like We've got an aquarium in town and uh, they, they, uh, they partnered up with us. And so we'll do uh, things like where you can buy tickets, members can buy discounted tickets uh, through our, our online banking uh, system, whether that's mobile or, or, or desktop and, and buy tickets to the aquarium uh, because it's important to our community. And, uh, and, and so that's just one example of kind of how we've, we've focused it. But, but really, you know, our, our digital platform being Alchemy uh, coming out of the box, it's really delivering a lot of those, uh, uh, th that baseline functionality that people like to see. So, you know, we talk often about the fact that, you know, making a good user experience is not just a top of glass experience. The reality is to do it well, you have to rethink the back office. What are you doing at Keesler to rethink the back office and to reconstruct for the digital platform that you're really implementing? one of the the strategies i've deployed here is product management and when you when you think about product management it's a very common term uh, in a software development house uh, but not always as common in the credit union space and so what i did is uh, we built out this product management practice that's holistic it's top down and what product management does is it, it looks at our digital platform and uh, it, it it makes sure that we're delivering on those needs that i mentioned but it does it in a way in which um, it, it's taking the entire organization uh, into account. And when I say taking the entire organization into account, we've got one individual who is the manager of that product. And then we have cross sections across the organization that come together on a monthly basis. And they really look at 
what we're doing and how we're delivering it. And, and you get some really key players in there, Jim. You get your marketing folks in there. Uh, you get your uh, contact center folks uh, in there. You get the retail delivery on the branch side in there. You get your fraud folks in there. And, and it's all about how do we service this thing the most effectively and efficiently and, and really deliver that, that customer uh, experience. And, you know, we're, we're not immune. Uh, we're getting really good. And this is one example where you get really good at breaking down silos. Silos exist uh, within organizations and they grow over time. And they can get they can become stronger and then they can become weaker uh, and having this product management approach for us has really kind of broken down the silos and made our digital effort very very collaborative um, you know we've done things like uh, rpas uh, in the back end um, for for um, various uh, types of uh, uh, file maintenance on accounts um, you know that's that's been something that was born out of uh, out of that that group um, out of out of that product management group, and interestingly enough, I've talked to I've talked to other credit unions, and and we all kind of use the same tech stack. There's that that buy build purchase model, right? And and we we tend to fall into we're gonna um, we're gonna partner. I'm sorry, we're gonna partner up with with a, a provider, and in this case, Alchemy. Um, but the key is to make it as tight as you can possibly make it, right? To just make sure that when a member's in there opening a new account that that integration is as tight as it can be with Rini link for, for our case. Um, or, or if, you know, we're looking at the fraud side to make sure that that fraud piece is, is tightly integrated. And I think that's the key when you talk about, you know, making sure you've got your operations efficient, making sure you got the back, the, the back of the office integrated with the front of the office. It's the, it's the approach of product management. And then it's just hyper-focused on making sure you've got good tight uh, integration with all those third parties that you're plugging in. You mentioned all those third parties. You know, almost all organizations today have to partner with third-party solution providers for speed and scale and to really get the best possible solution for whatever you're looking to solve for. You know, Keesler engages in third-party solution providers to create better products, services, and higher levels of engagement with members. How do you select partners and engage with them as to looking beyond why you have to look beyond, I should say, your core providers? You know, because in a lot of cases you have a duplicate, what, what some may see as a duplication of, of engagement or efforts. How do you select third party solution providers and where do you put your energy? It really comes down to, in some cases, it's that best of breed and best of suite uh, approach. And, uh, and when we look at, like, we'll use Alchemy as the example, you know, I'm looking at that as uh, a best of suite. Uh, but what you do have to consider is, is what, what's going to get me where I need to go um, in terms of a member experience. And when we talk about member experience, it has to be frictionless, it has to be easy. So, so how can I find something that is going to accomplish that, uh, in this case, in the digital world? And you know, you really need to look at, um, at like I said, the integration. And, uh, and in a lot of cases, we bought this platform in particular because, you know, we do want to be able to go best of breed. We do want to be able to find those things that we feel like um, are, are going to be uh, a differentiator uh, for us. And again, we're all, a lot of us are picking the, the same providers. Um, you know, it's, it's about what is going to meet the member's need at the end of the day and what's going to be efficient uh, for the organization and then delivering that in a way in which you know it can be easily consumed so you, you you've got a good clean integration to that to that partner so when you talk about that you know obviously digital transformation is not an end to a means it's really an ongoing process when you're looking at your to-do list over the next 12 maybe 18 months what are some of the things that you're trying to fix at Keesler to make it a better digital experience? You know, I think when you talk about digital transformation and, and yeah, it is definitely a journey. Um, we, we put a, a strong focus on uh, digital or online banking, digital banking for our members, uh, but you can't lose sight of everything that goes on within the organization from, from the back office perspective as well. And so we feel like, you know, I mentioned the the product management piece. We've got a good process going there. We've got a good set of people in charge of that. 
and uh, and and that's a that's a a group now and a process that is continually looking at at innovating. Our focus now has been and and we're getting close to uh, the final stages of really getting the organization into the cloud. Uh, I'm not a big fan of being in the data center business. Um, and we had a lot of that legacy data center stuff going on. And so we took care of the front end and now it's really about taking care of that, that back end from a digital transformation uh, perspective. And we're about between 85, 90% of the way migrated to, to the cloud right now. And so, you know, once you get up there, it's, it's a question of getting up there and then really getting into the DevOps side of things and, and, and making the, the, uh, the operations efficient. And I'm a, I'm a big proponent of do what you do well and do it often. And, uh, you know, I don't want, I don't want folks having to, you know, change out hardware in, in the data center. It's really about getting focused on high value tasks, um, you know, doing that DevOps, uh, making the organization more efficient. And so from a digital transformation perspective here, it's going to be about getting the back office, you know, up into the cloud. It's going to be about doing automation with the back office, uh, you know, looking at things uh, we're, we're, we're full on with RPA right now. Um, but this generative AI, I mean, it's such an interesting topic. And I think there's just so many opportunities there that we've only really just scratched the surface. You know, I, I spend time just thinking about all the problems that it, that it could solve. And, uh, you know, they're just, they're numerous. And, uh, and I think there's going to be a tremendous opportunity there uh, with how fast that, that technology is evolving for us to start adopting that. You know, you, you mentioned that you're, you're using your current teams to build better product management practices. And sometimes by using your existing teams and, and teams that have been doing things a certain way for years, you can get into the rut of digitizing current process. In other words, simply doing things you used to do before faster in a digital way. How do you manage the process so that you're not just digitizing old processes, but building better digital solutions? How do you, how do you manage that with existing employees? Well, yeah, and that's a good question. I think, uh, you know, you do have, you build up what I call legacy over time. And there's these processes that you build and you repeat. And then you get to a point where you say, well, hey, let's take that process and, and digitize it without even taking the opportunity to take a step back and say, does it even make sense anymore? Is it even the right process for us to continue to follow, right? And, uh, and so what we've done uh, to kind of tackle some of that is, we do a business process analysis. And so any project that we undertake at the credit union, we assign BPAs and we do an as is process uh, review. So, so we look at what does the process do today? Uh, and you know, through that process, we're bringing in, not only the BPAs are doing the work, um, but you're also bringing in the business units to take a look at it. And, and we're really talking a lot about critical thinking and being able to see the big picture. And, and getting folks uh, you know, organized around the possibilities that can exist. Because not only when you bring those people together, you can look at the process and say, geez, we can do this better. But sometimes you don't even know what better looks like. You don't even know what, what exists out there from a, a solution perspective to kind of measure or marry up uh, that, that broken process or that antiquated process. So it's really about taking the time and bringing the people together and having a process to facilitate that. And, and that's where we feel like, you know, with our business process uh, team, our project management team, uh, and then our business units. Uh, and we're by no means perfect at it, um, but we're making conscious efforts to move in that direction. I mean, you mentioned we've been in business since 1947. Uh, we doubled in size. We went from uh, 2 billion to uh, over 4 billion. And, and in some cases, when you experience growth in that short period of time, you can continue to operate like you're a $2 billion credit union, even though you're a $4 billion credit union, right? And so we recognize that. And that's why we put some of this stuff in place is to try and uh, to change the mindset, uh, look at things differently, and then employ whatever, whatever method we can, whether it's a new technology or redesign. You know, it's interesting. It's something you said at the very beginning of our discussion in that you have a new management team almost at the entire executive level that came in five years ago. That is not by itself one of the things that created the growth you've had, but it also gets everybody on board because they realize, for lack of a better term, there's a new sheriff in town. This is the way we're going to be doing things. 
But it, it is very clear that your organization has involved your teams in the process, which makes it also work better if people know what the mission is, what the goal is, what the destination is, and they're part of that building process. You're going to get people on board. You know, it, what's interesting is you keep on mentioning the growth, but it's not been growth for growth's sake. You know, while you've doubled in size and gone from 2.5 to 4.2 in the last five years, you also have won Forbes magazine's top credit union in Mississippi for five consecutive years. And that by itself is pretty good, but they've only had the ranking for five years. So who knows how far back it would have gone. But it's interesting how you've held that title, which really is not about growth. It's, it's about a lot of elements, customer experience, ratings on, you know, as you said, satisfaction ratings. It's about your assets, about your strength. You know, has it been really just the management team that has set a new bar as to what has to be achieved, as to what's happened last five years? Because, you know, it's very interesting digging into your organization. You know, you, you had okay growth, and but but it was it's relatively static over time. And then all of a sudden, last five years, six years, there's been a lot happening. And, and it has not been fictional. It's not just because the positive inflows. It's not just because of COVID. I mean, that five years covers a lot of time and the, and the growth has been consistent. You've added branches, but not for the sake of just added, adding branches. A member that comes in, what do they feel is different about Keesler? Take Taking your Keesler hat off a little bit here and, and being a member and saying, why is it that more and more people are, are coming to Keesler? You're right. It is more. Uh, it's more than the people. It's. Um, I can't help but give you this example. Okay, yesterday, this just happened yesterday, and we do this every year. Uh, we do this program called Backpacks for Bright Futures. I saw that. Yeah, very. I was yeah. going to ask about that. By the way, yes. Yeah. So, uh, and that started with our board of directors, and it's really been executed by by management, by the team, and what Backpacks for Bright Futures is. It started five years ago, by the way. And, and every single kindergartner uh, within our field of membership uh, gets a backpack with all the school supplies that they need oh, wow. for the first day of school. Okay. And we spend, we spend quite a bit of money uh, on this. And so uh, I was there yesterday. Um, we got the school buses lining up, you know, every yellow school bus with the school district's name on the side of it. And we got the forklifts going and we are loading up these school supplies. Each one is boxed with a backpack and all the supplies and and we're handing those off and how many do you give away total you know what we've over the last five years we've done fifty thousand backpacks oh my gosh fifty thousand backpacks and so think about that i mean these kids you know in in some cases you know you've got folks that they don't know how they're going to be able to afford buying those school supplies for their kids on the first day right or you get the kids that can't afford it and then they get all the fancy stuff i mean with this that kindergartner coming in first day Every kid's got the same school supply. Everybody's starting on the same foot. Um, mom and dad maybe don't have to worry about spending that extra 50, 60 bucks on the school supplies. It, it's just a good thing to do. And look, uh, our kids are our future and education is our future. And, and we're all about supporting that. But our purpose at Keister Federal, you ask about the difference. Our, our purpose is to focus on our communities. Uh, and we're we're really serious about focusing on our communities to the point where, you know, we gave away over eleven million dollars last year to to our local communities. That goes in in terms of charities. That goes back to even member give back straight to to member pockets. And so, um, yeah, it, it it's not just a leadership team. Um, it, it's a feeling. It, it's about being part of a community. Um, you know, moving down here uh, from Minnesota, I think. Uh, you know, I remember when Katrina came through and I was far removed from that. Um, but, uh, you know, coming down here and, and hearing the stories uh, and then even been through a few hurricane scares down here myself since I've been here the last five years. You can really tell uh, a community that's been through some hardship and, and knows how to pick one another up. And, um, you know, you look back even to to during the Katrina days, this credit union was there for people. And by the way. Just so the listeners understand, your organization got destroyed in that process. I mean, two branches got completely destroyed, but you were up and running. You were committed to being up and running so people could have access to funds. But also, you had you had employees working on behalf of people in the community, even though their house may have been destroyed. I mean, it's an amazing story. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things where you just roll up your sleeve and 
you know, you figure out how to, how to put it together and, and how to make it work. Um, you know, th there are other things that we do too. the government shutdown, you know, we just had that looming government shutdown, but it has shut down before. And, uh, Jim, when the, when the government shuts down, we have a high concentration of government employees down here. Uh, what we did is, uh, we paid everybody's, uh, paycheck. We went back and looked through the ACH, uh, determined its origination spot, knew that they were a government employee, and, and we paid everybody's paycheck until the government came through. And then once the government came through, uh, you know, we were made whole. But but those are the types of things that we do to just try and, and look out for our members. And we've been fortunate we're in a position to do that. I mean, we're at 13 and a, 13 and a half percent capital. That's a good position to be in. You know, 7% is well capitalized. So we definitely got the pockets to be able to do it. But you know, those pockets exist because of the loyalty we built with our members and, and just the community that we've got. So getting back to the backpack program, is that just for members, children that are in kindergarten or is it for all kindergartners that are entering kindergarten? No, it's for every every kindergartner on the on the uh, within our field of membership. Uh, you don't have to be a member. It's interesting because you think about kindergarten and you think about kids that look at other kids in any community and say, Am, am I a winner? Am I a loser? Do I have? Do I not have? You know, and to have it so that everybody has something that is completely the same builds builds confidence in a, in a child, builds confidence with a parent sending the child to school. And I would imagine in those backpacks, you have more and more organizations within the community that want to partner with you to be part of that backpack. It's a, it's a very unique program. And I, and I saw that on your Facebook page and a couple other places. And I was amazed, but I didn't realize it's as extensive as it is. That's, that's pretty amazing. And you, you mentioned your give back program and, and you have a, you have a massive amount of member give backs in, on your checking accounts and credit cards. And that's through a partnership as well. But could you explain a little bit about what that give back program is? Yeah. So, you know, on the credit card side, you know, it's, it, we've got uh, two different credit cards. There's a cash back and there's a rewards card. But uh, what we did when we put that into place is, uh, you know, our board has been really focused on making sure that we're giving back to our members. And, uh, you know, those people that are using our products and services, uh, they should be rewarded. And we, we, we came together as a management team and said, you know, what are some things that we can do to give rates straight back to members and, and rates straight back to their pockets? And um, the credit card piece, we felt like, like that was a really a win-win for us. Um, you know, obviously we get some interchange off of it. Some people hold balances, uh, but but we're not making any money on our credit card program, to be honest with you. It is basically all going back to our members uh, in terms of, of cash back and, and, and through the rewards uh, system. It's a 2% cash back card. Uh, it's it's even more rich on on the rewards side uh, on, on just the rewards card. Uh, you know the other thing you talk about is the checking account. You know we're giving back uh, cash back uh, through our checking as well. You know we're a Casasa uh, customer, so uh, we we have a very rich uh, Casasa program going on there. Five percent on your checking account right now. You know we're all looking for liquidity, but um, you know that I don't know that would exist if we weren't in the current market we're in. But it would still be a very healthy and rich plan. Uh, and, and those are the ways in which, you know, we're giving straight back into uh, members' pockets. But then but then there's the charities on top of it, too. You know, we've got a, a strong military presence here. So uh, we do our Gold Star Memorials. Um, you know, we, we raise over $100,000 every year in our golf, golf tournament for combat wounded veterans on South Mississippi. Um, you know, it just goes back in, in a lot of different ways. Um, we're big on CASA. Uh, you know, these, these are coin-appointed kids. Uh, that that are kind of stuck in the middle, you know, they're, they're, their parents can't take care of them. They really don't have any place to go. Uh, and we're a big supporter of that, making sure that those kids uh, have some supplies, uh, have the things they need in the short term, uh, or even taking care of them at, at Christmas time. So, um, you, you know, again, as I talk about it, it, it's really just about what does the community need? Uh, where, where are the gaps and, and how can we fill them? We're actually getting ready to roll out a survey to our members to say, give us some ideas on some other things uh, that we can give back to. Um, we're trying to seek some input from them and you know what's near and dear to people's heart. And, and, and we'll put that together and, 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 and try and find the, the best place where we can, we can allocate those, uh, those funds, those resources. And you know, we're, we're actually in the process too of giving cars away, believe it or not, to members. And uh, we're doing four cars a year. Uh, we gave a car away at our annual meeting. Uh, we just gave a car away to a gal. Uh, single mom raising three kids. It was a, it couldn't have went to a better person. Uh, it, it worked out really well. So, 
Um, you know, a lot of those things buy you goodwill in the community, but they're also the, the right things to do in the community too. Well, and, and it helps employ morale. You know, we sometimes forget how good it feels to be part of an organization that you're proud of. There's a lot of people that work and simply do it because it's a job. But when you see things like this, the give back program is interesting. You know, there's a lot of challenges that members have had over the last two years, especially making ends meet. I mean, we, we you know, COVID was not a, a winner. And now you come out of COVID and you have an economic crisis that everybody is feeling the pinch. It's getting a little bit better right now. But these give back programs is a continuous reminder that you're looking out for the communities you serve. And, and it's interesting, as I looked at all the different things your organization does, one of the things that's kind of in the background, but it's very prominent on your website, is you also offer free financial planning webinars every two weeks at no cost. Now, who conducts these webinars and how is Kiesler hoping to expand the financial wellness content maybe in the future as, as organizations are trying more and more to to show empathy and to actually work on behalf of their members. Yeah, you know, times uh, times are interesting. I know that, you know, there's a lot of talk about there about the uh, the amount of savings people have and, and whether or not they can they can make ends meet in the case of an emergency. And a lot of people don't, and we're, we're not immune to that either. And, and we know that that's a challenge for folks. And so, um, you know, we're all about making sure that we're providing education. Uh, we just recently hired that second person, that financial education specialist that you mentioned. And, and really they're all about, you know, providing those seminars uh, and even meeting with with folks. Um, we, we hear some of the stories that come out of there and, uh, you know, some, some of the success stories. And I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not a tearful guy, but I mean, when I hear some of those things, I'm, you know, I, I got the tears are, are welding up in me because um, you know, we're able to help some people and, and and you take for granted what you know, because you're in the financial institution space. And so, you know, sometimes you just assume everybody should know what you know, but there are so many people that just don't know how to do the basics of finance. And that's really what it's all about is, is taking the time uh, to teach these people the basics of finance and they're doing those seminars, but we're also pretty heavy in the local media market too. And so, you know, on Sunday mornings or Sunday uh, afternoons, you know, we're doing those spotlights on the local uh, TV stations where they're talking about, uh, you know, financial wellness, uh, you know, how to prepare yourself. Um, and, and again, um, you know, just kind of taking a few different approaches at it, whether it's the media uh, or, or those, um, you know, those classes uh, that we offer. Uh, that, that, again, goes back to the community thing, right? Focused on community. That, that is all about um you know, focusing on that community. And Jim, you brought something up to start with too, about the employees and, and really feeling connected. Um, when, when, when you talk about the financials and we do a lot with our, with our team, you know, we talk about the financials in terms of personal gain and personal benefit, right? The, the better the credit union does, uh, the better everybody does, but, but there's also that social fabric, that social connectedness to the things that we do. Uh, and the more money we make, the more money we can give back to our communities. The more money we can give back to our communities, the better our communities will be, right? And so that that's something that, um, yeah, everybody wants the personal gratification to get a paycheck at the end of the day, but there's got to be more to it. And that more to it for us is about our communities and and actually seeing the, the dollars and, and and the give back and, and seeing the financial planning and the financial uh, education that's going on. That's a piece of it. You know, you're, you you obviously, Keesler is obviously part of every family in your community that you serve. You're, you're an integral part of what happens there. And as you said, you're, you, your formation was of the military, federal credit union, and you really serve the, the Air Force in that area. And you even have branches overseas, which, which caught me by surprise, I have to admit. But that also has to do with the Air Force and, and being able to provide services. You know, it's interesting that as part of this growth, as part of your new management team, as part of everything you've discussed right now, we, we talked about a lot, a lot of good news stories. What has been the biggest challenge over the last five years for you? Yeah, you know, the cha I think the challenge is um, you can be your victim of your own success too. And, uh, you know, as we mentioned, when you grow and you grow as fast as you do, uh, you really have to make sure that, you know, you've got everything organized and everything is in place uh, to accommodate accommodate that growth. And, you know, when you were 2 billion, you could do certain things, but when you're 4 billion approaching 5 billion, uh, those things look a little bit different. And, and so as we evolve and, and grow into our growth, 
you know, the organization needs to evolve and grow into that, uh, i.e. Uh, people process, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that that's taken some time. And, and we actually spent two years of uh, what we coined years of refinement. And that was taking the opportunity to really take a breath and, and, and look and evaluate, take stock of where we're at and see how we can, you know, improve things so that we can anticipate the next set of growth. Because Jim, we're not, we're not stopping. Uh, it's going to continue to go. And, uh, you know, we have our eyes, eyes set on, on, on bigger numbers like everybody else does, but we feel like we've got a good playbook and an and approach to, uh, to, to make that a reality. And so it's, it's going to be an exciting time uh, at Keesler here for the next five years. Um, you know, and I think uh, just growing into that growth as we continue to to move at that pace, uh, you know, that, that's going to be that's going to be an important thing for us. So, you know, Jason, when we look at all the good things you've done, obviously there's things on the horizon that you want to achieve. If you were to take one, maybe two things that you really say, I really want to improve this. And it, it may be something that's not a highest priority, but maybe something you go, it, it's just got to be fixed. What would that be? So, Jim, I got one that that I have been spending a lot of time thinking about, and uh, it, it is all about new account opening. And when I when I think about the process we have in place today, and I mentioned, you know, a lot of us use the same technology, and uh, you know what what that technology uh, dictates is, you know, a member opens an account and uh, either in a branch or online, uh, and then that member is enrolled in digital. And uh, and then they go on their merry way. But we all know that that's a very inefficient process. And there's some regulations that have to do with that. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what I've been thinking a lot about is, you know, if I've got an app today, my mobile banking app, and that, that just so happens to be Alchemy, um, why is it that I can't just, if I'm not a member, download the app and then just become a member, right? Why is it today that I have to go and create a brand new account uh, through another system, and then I got to create my account in Alchemy and log in. Why can't I short circuit that whole thing? Hey, if you want to be a member here of Keesler Federal Credit Union, go download our app. Boom. Uh, and then inside of that, we have to streamline that process, uh, and we have to get better at the KYC. And I'm, I talked about generative AI before, and uh, and I feel like there's just a ton of opportunity uh, on the KYC side to really enhance that process. Uh, to the point where you can make what I just described uh, a reality and, and make it a reality in, in a compliant fashion. So, and, and, and if you take it a step back further, you know, new, new member acquisition is king. I know we talk, about, we talk about loans, we talk about deposits, but none of that exists without members. And so many of us, we, we get into measuring uh, loans and deposits and, you know, and, and net interest income and, and, and all the various measures we're looking at, asset quality, delinquency, you got to get members. Members are the key. And then once you get them, you got to keep them. So uh, the other thing is, is, you know, we, we, we have these digital platforms today that I feel are very uh, service orientated. Uh, if we can get them flipped to be more retail based, um, where, where they're, they're more useful, it's not just me going in and transferring money, but it's me, you know, going in there and doing something that, you know, maybe facilitates an e-commerce transaction or maybe facilitates uh, a local business transaction, something that makes it more of a central uh, kind of a, a, a consumer uh, hub, so to speak, uh, I, I think is going to be more beneficial and better for the user experience at the end of the day and then lead to that member retention piece and that member satisfaction side. You know, great answer to that because it is the front side of what you do. You know, we start, we measure it for the digital bank report. Report. We measure how long it takes to open an account. And, and a lot of organizations say we have a digital account opening process, but it's still 13 minutes long. To get to that five minutes, that, that holy grail that we look at, you got to change a lot of things. And you just mentioned you have to change the integration between one platform and another. You need to change the way you look at new account open. You have to you have to find ways to replace old strategies that were in place that are built into our mindset saying, you know, it's kind of like the old signature cards. You know, oh, we have to have signature cards. Then you have to build it differently. What's interesting is solution providers like Alchemy are the kind of partners that really say, what is the best case scenario? Who are who is doing it right? And how do we get to that point? And 
these partners across the industry now are working harder and harder to get their financial institutions there, not just for their benefit, but also for obviously the financial institutions benefit and for the end member or customer. And, and it's a, it's a really good vision, but I'm going to get back to one of the first things you said in order to achieve that, in order to do banking differently, you need a management that's willing to do that. And you need, again, you mentioned bringing in new management five years ago. It shows in the growth. It shows in the commitment to the communities. It shows in your backpack program. It shows in what's supported. And I would imagine, just by talking to you for a little while and seeing your expressions, that you get a lot of support to do the things that are going to be hard to do. A lot of organizations walk away from those challenges and go, Whew, we got that accomplished. We're about where everybody else is, as opposed to saying, how can we achieve beyond that? How can we work in a disruptive manner as a startup? And that, that's really what you've done. I mean, I, again, I look at your numbers. It looks like you became a startup about five or six years ago, and, it, and the results show that. So based on what you've seen in the last five years, based on what brought you to Biloxi, what recommendations would you give to banks and credit unions as they attempt to grow and become more future ready? You mentioned, uh, you know, all the change and, and, and the hard stuff. And I guess I am a glutton for punishment. Uh, I've been through six uh, online banking conversions and, and two core conversions. And, uh, you know, anytime you do those things, they're painful, but they're the right things to do for for whatever it is at, at that point in time. Right. And and so. I would say, you know, to to any other credit union out there, you've got to make sure that you've got the right people in the right places doing the right things. Do what you do well and do it often and get those people in those positions. Um, I, I subscribe to a servant leadership approach, Jim. Um, you know, I used to be the doer. Uh, I'm more the strategy and the vision guy, but I surround myself with people that are experts in what they do. Uh, and you really have to surround yourself with a lot of smart people. And I'm fortunate that that I get to do that and I get to show up at the office every day and there's people that are challenging me now. And uh, and that's what it's all about is, is bringing that team together. Um, and, and I think you can't be afraid to rethink things. You can't be afraid to look at things differently. Um, you know, in, in, in some cases it's too hard. Yeah, it is. It, it can be too hard. Uh, but But anything that's worth doing is hard to do. And it's a question of getting past that. And, you know, you can't do it as a one man band, a one person army. Uh, you need a group around you. And, you know, I'm going back to surrounding yourself with good people. Well, both internally and externally. I mean, you've mentioned it already that, you know, when we don't have that capability internally, that's where the solution, the third party solution providers like Alchemy come in and other organizations say, I need to amp this up and we can't do it with our current team. You know, Jim, you're, that's absolutely right. These third party service providers you know, we, we'd all like to be able to be in a position to build, you know, build the solutions uh, ourselves. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of us are just we're just having to take the things that the vendors have off the shelf. But I, I just said vendors and, and you really you cannot look at these folks as vendors. No. They are partners. They are partners. And when you come together and you make the investments that you make, you have to be involved with them. You have to find a way to get your voice uh, heard. We're fortunate that you know, we, we, we talk a lot with the folks at Alchemy and they're very receptive to us. Uh, and we spend a lot of time telling them about what our members needs are. And, uh, and, and they're, they're receptive. Um, and, and that's a partnership. And, and we're not afraid to tell them the things that they don't want to hear. And they're not afraid to tell us the things uh, that we might, might not want to hear. And that's, that's a true partnership. And I'll always tell anybody that I do business with, if at the end of the day, I can be a referenceable client for you, then it's a success. For both sides of the equation. Yep. For both sides of the equation is I want to be a referenceable for you. So, uh, and, and we're fortunate, fortunate to be in those positions with, a, with a lot of folks, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's about looking at things different. It's about challenging the status quo. It's about understanding your member and your marketplace and getting together with partners to solve those problems and deliver on, on, on whatever that promise is that you have. Jason, thank you so much for being on the show today. It's really been a pleasure. I, you're definitely an organization I'm going to revisit uh, uh, in a year and say, okay, how did we do? You know, because it's, it's, it's so much going on and, and you're a good example of a person that, you know, there's never enough time in the day 
and you're finding ways to distribute what time is available and, and getting things done. Congratulations on your company's growth. Congratulations on that backpack program. That is going to stick with me for a long time in that it, just the impact that has on every child to know they got something that, that gets them started quickly. And it makes it so that no parent feels that they haven't served their child well, which, you know, it's been a long time since I've had a kindergartner, but I know that there's a lot of doubt out there. And to, to give them a head start, you know, well before the school year starts, um, those are a lot of happy kids. So congratulations on everything and look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Visionaries Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show and our deep dive into all things that can elevate your digital game. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others, post on social media, or leave a thumbs up or comment. More importantly, if you'd like to be featured on the Visionaries Podcast, reach out to me, Jim Bruce, at my email address, and we'll see if we can't put you on the show. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Haslidge, and audio and visual engineer, Chris Fafalius. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, better experiences fuel business growth.